Good evening. It's good to be back with you, congregation. It's been uh, been too long. And uh, I want to thank you for giving the opportunity to myself and uh, others from the congregation to attend Synod um, 2023. And I want you to know that your uh, representatives served admirably. And um, those who were there for the first time and uh, one who, um, and two who were there uh, again after many times. And uh, I, I thank the Lord for the direction and the um, the continuity with last year's uh, decision uh, regarding human sexuality that seemed to be moving forward um, with truth and with grace and uh, that in spite of some attempted roadblocks uh, it appears that the Church of Christ is uh, at least called CRC is attempting to stay faithful to the scripture and faithful to the good news of the gospel that we who are called by Christ to be forgiven of sin are called also out of it to live a new life with him and uh, that's why we come again tonight, don't we? To be restored and renewed again in our relationship with our covenant God. And so uh, if you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here tonight. If you're uh, someone who's been here a while, we're glad you're here too. I will say this, if you want to know more about Synod, um, some of us are planning to give a, uh, a report on it next Sunday morning. And so I'd like to give you more of an idea of what, what went on there as you were praying for us. I want to thank you for praying too. And for some of you who even texted and said, you're falling asleep there on the floor of Synod, I see it. <laughs> um, or, or said, you don't seem too interested. Or, oh, wow, that was interesting. Thank you for keeping me on my toes. So uh, let's uh, remember that our God is the God who has called us his own, but also the God who wants us to name him as ours and to love him. Isaiah the prophet, remembering the call of the first and the second commandment of the Ten Commandments, not to have any idols. Isaiah prophesied this to the people in Isaiah 44, verse 9. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. And then Isaiah 46 speaks to two of those gods and their idols being carried. Isaiah 46, Bel stoops down, Nebo stoops low. Their idols are born, carried by beasts of burden. Imagine an ox cart drawing along a stone idol. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary, but listen to me, O house of Jacob, you who remain in the house of Israel. I have upheld you. I have carried you since you were conceived, since your birth. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, I am he who will carry you. I have made you and will sustain you. And I will rescue you. It's wonderful to know the living God and so knowing that he has called us away from idols to know him, we sing his praise. Let's sing. Creation sings the Father's song. Let's stand to sing.
God, the creator of the earth, the land of the sea, the heavens, is not a God of our devising, a God that we've made up, but the God who has created us and upholds our lives. Grace, mercy, peace to you who know the Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's greet each other in his name. This God that we confess is a triune God. Would you join me in speaking our faith together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
as an office bearer in the Church of Christ called Christian Reformed. I'm thankful that um, others of you have agreed to let your name stand to be an, at least an option for office bearer, saying, Lord, I'm willing. And I thank each of you who were willing, and we're thankful for those new names that have been drawn um, this morning. And um, I remind you that those office bearers are called to what was in the past called a form of subscription, now a covenant for office bearers. And they agree to sign on to this covenant for office bearers, saying that I will promote and defend and uphold the creeds and confessions of this church, one of the, them, the Apostles' Creed, that we just spoke, that I will defend those for the honor of God and as those who are leading and teaching and directing the affairs of the church. And so I ask you to turn to page 1004 in your gray songbook, page 1004, as we install new office bearers for a new term beginning at the 1st of July. Page 1004, the ordination of elders and deacons. Today, we celebrate God's gift of faithful leadership for his people. We joyfully thank him for elders and deacons who've served well and completed their terms of office. And we praise him for providing their successors. And those who have served well should be noted here. We note that Wally Bogert, Ward Van Persum, and Glenn Bauma are completing their terms of service as elder. And deacons, Dan Brunst, Wade Hoffland, and Jeff Sager are completing their terms, three-year terms of service at the end of June. I want to thank each of you. It's been a pleasure to serve with you. I have felt emboldened and encouraged. I have felt uh, listened to and sometimes even challenged. And uh, it's been a blessing to serve with you. And uh, I pray that God will give you grace as you now uh, step out of that office to know what he's calling you to in the next days and months. In the office bearers of the church, we see the love of Christ for his people. As the Lord of the church, he appoints leaders and by his spirit equips them so that believers may grow in faith, develop disciplined Christian living, serve others in selfless love, and share with all the good news of salvation. He taught us the spirit of true leadership when our Lord said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Elders serve by governing the church in Christ's name. They received this task when Christ entrusted the apostles and their successors with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Elders are thus responsible for the spiritual well-being of God's people. They must provide true preaching and teaching, regular celebration of the sacraments, and faithful counsel and discipline, while keeping in confidence those matters entrusted to them and they must promote fellowship and hospitality among believers, ensure good order in the church, and stimulate witness to all people. Deacons serve by showing mercy to the church and to all people. They received this task in the early church when the apostles designated special persons for the works of mercy. In Christ's name, the deacons relieve victims of injustice, by this they show that Christians live by the spirit of the kingdom, fervently desiring to give life the shape of things to come. Deacons are therefore called to assess needs, promote stewardship and hospitality, collect and disperse resources for benevolence, and develop programs of assistance. They are called to speak words of Christian encouragement. Thus in word as well as deed, they demonstrate the care of our Lord himself. These tasks of elders and deacons call for believers who are Christ-like, who are mature in the faith, and who exercise their offices with prayer, patience, and humility. 
Now we intend to ordain elders and deacons and to install them for terms of service in this congregation. Those appointed to the office of elder are Marlon Volink and John Wagoner. Dan Tracy is not able to be with us tonight. Those appointed to the office of deacon are Brandon Bonema, Travis DeGroat, and Daniel Eason. To express acceptance of these offices, each of you are asked to stand and hear in the presence of God and His church to answer the following questions. So I'll ask you to stand at this time. And uh, I will be addressing you in a moment alphabetically, which just happens to mean that the deacons, you're early in the alphabet and you elders are later in the alphabet. Won't say anything about age in that. It just happens to be. Okay. To express your acceptance of these offices, you're asked to stand. Tell me now, do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God himself is calling you to these holy offices? Do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the Word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life? Do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all teaching which contradicts them? Do you promise to do the work of your offices faithfully in a way worthy of your calling and in submission to the government and discipline of the church? Brandon, what is your answer? Travis, what is your answer? Daniel, what is your answer? Marlon, what is your answer? And John, what is your answer? May God, our Heavenly Father, who has called you to these offices, guide you by His Word, equip you with His Spirit, and so prosper your ministries that His church may increase, and His name will receive all the praise and glory. Amen. Elders, I charge you, guard yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Be a friend and Christ-like example to youth and children. Give clear and cheerful guidance to young people. By word and example, bear up God's people in their pain and weakness and celebrate their joys with them. Hold in trust all sensitive matters confided to you. Encourage the aged to persevere in God's promises. Be wise counselors who support and strengthen the pastors. Be compassionate, yet firm and consistent in rebuke and discipline. Know the Scriptures which are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Pray continually for the church. Remember at all times that if you would truly give spiritual leadership in the household of faith, you must be completely mastered by our Lord. I charge you deacons. Inspire faithful stewardship in this congregation. Remind us that from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Teach us to be merciful. Prompt us to seize new opportunities to worship God with offerings of our wealth, our time, and our ability. Realize that benevolence is a quality of our life in Christ and not merely a matter of financial assistance. Therefore, Minister to rich and poor alike, both within and outside the church. Weigh the needs of causes and use the church's resources discerningly. Be compassionate to the needy. Respect their need for dignity. Hold in trust all sensitive matters confided to you. Encourage them with words that create hope in their hearts and with deeds that bring joy into their lives. Be prophetic critics of waste, injustice, and selfishness in our society. And be sensitive counselors 
to the victims of such evils. Let your lives be above reproach. Live as examples of Jesus Christ. Look to the interests of others. People of God, would you now stand? As a minister of Christ, I now charge you, people of God, to receive these office bearers as Christ's gifts to the church. Recognize in them the Lord's provision for healthy congregational life. Hold them in honor. Take their counsel seriously. Respond to them with obedience and respect. Accept their help with thanks. Sustain them in prayer and encourage them with your support, especially when they feel the burden of their office. Acknowledge them as the Lord's servants among you. Do you, congregation, pledge to receive them as you have been charged? We do, God helping us. You may be seated. In a moment, as we give our offerings, these office bearers are going to step forward and they're going to sign the covenant for office bearers. You may wonder what they're signing. If any of you are interested in seeing what they sign to, uh, please step forward after church and just take a look. You will be able to read uh, three paragraphs. I'm looking down there, five paragraphs, some are shorter, um, of what they are pledging themselves to. Let's pray. Our merciful Father in heaven, we thank you. You've provided faithful and gifted people to serve as elders and deacons. As these new office bearers assume their responsibilities, we recognize that they have many other responsibilities each day throughout their lives and each night. And so we pray that you'd fill them with your spirit that you'd endow them with your wisdom and grant them strength for this task. Make them faithful workers in your vineyard. Under their guidance, may your church grow in every spiritual grace, in faith which is open and unashamed, and in committed service that promotes your reign in the world. Help them to perform their duties with enthusiasm and humility. And in their work, grant them a sense of sustained awe, which is rooted in daily adoration of you, their Lord, a wonder that they are co-laborers with you, the King. Through them, may your name be honored, your church be served, and your kingdom come. Help us, your people, to accept them gladly, to encourage them always, and respect them for the sake of your precious Son, our Lord. And yes, Lord, as there are many needs in this congregation, and they will be collecting offerings and seeing to their disbursement, we ask that we might entrust to them and to you our resources, trusting that you who said, bring your whole tithe into the storehouse, will distribute it to those in need. Give wisdom and discernment, and give us generous hearts even now as we bring our offerings and lay them at your feet, because you have offered us salvation through your Son, eternal life forever, a new life beginning now. In Jesus' name, amen. We have opportunity to give our offerings, and we do so willingly as we sing.
turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Acts, chapter 19, continuing a series of messages through the book of Acts. Acts 19, verses 21 to 41. The gospel came with power to the city of Ephesus. Many were converted. They came, and, and as they were being changed, their lives expressed that. They uh, publicly confessed sins and burned their, their uh, sort of symbols of their old life of sorcery and, and the scrolls of sorcery. And we read in Acts 19, verse 21, After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He didn't go right away, and so we read, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. About that time, in Ephesus, there arose a disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger, not only that our trade will lose its name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not to do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends in Christ, when the gospel changes lives, many don't like the change. Some feel threatened. Again, if you go back into chapter 19, just paragraphs before this, you can see how God's Spirit visited Ephesus and how after some false prophets tried to cast out demons in the name of Christ and Paul, the demons said, we know Christ, we know Paul, but we don't know you. You don't have any power. And they were beaten 
And the whole city came under a fear of the Lord when this happened. Some began to believe and confess their sins publicly, and then others began big bonfires, burning all their scrolls, all the things that they had used magically and and somehow demonically to attempt to have a contact with something bigger than them. And the scrolls were very expensive, says chapter 19, 19, but they were burned in favor of following Jesus. The Ephesian community, though, came to be threatened or feel threatened by this change, threatened by the way. Maybe the way doesn't mean much to me or you. We read at verse 23 about that time there was a great disturbance about the way. What is the way? The way is shorthand for the church, Christ's followers, the Christian church, those who walk in the ways of his teachings, for Jesus said, I am the way, John 14, 6. And later he said, if you love me, only verses later, you will follow my ways, you'll obey my commands. You won't have idols, you'll burn them. Walk in my way. Well, the Jews hated these words of Jesus, who called himself the way. First of all, they hated his words because he called himself the I am. The Jews knew very well what Jesus was claiming. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob met Moses in a burning bush and called himself I am. The Jews wouldn't believe it though his miracles were very much like the God of the Old Testament who would give food and drink to his people as Jesus on the mountainside. And the Gentiles, well, they hated Jesus for a different reason. The Greeks hated him for his exclusivity, for he not only said, I am, he said, I am the way. Not a way, not another way. I'm the only way to God. They didn't mind him being identified as a god. The Gentile Greeks had many gods, hundreds if not thousands, many with idol temples. Many, many altars were built to burn incense to these gods as many ways were open to them to get to the gods. But the Christian's God, Jesus, didn't just say, I'm one of many or I'm another way. He said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. They felt threatened by the way. And the way threatened their idols. Idols of money, power, and Artemis. At verse 24, we meet Demetrius. He was a silversmith. Demetrius made little shrines, little silver altars upon which incense could be burned, but they were really kind of trinkets. And special things to take home and set in their homes to protect them from evil. Shrines to Artemis, the Greek goddess of sex and fertility. But let's not kid ourselves. Demetrius had other idols than these little silver shrines. What's idolatry? Too often, I think, we think of short statues or tall temples built of stone. But Tim Keller in his book, Counterfeit Gods, says an idol is this, idolatry is this, it's taking some incomplete joy of this world, something God has given us as a gift, some incomplete joy of this world and building our whole lives upon it. Taking good things like food, money, power, pleasure, sex, Good gifts. But the Ten Commandments warn us, don't make them more important than God. And Tim Keller goes further to say that most of us can trace back our negative emotions in life, any negative emotion, to something that we place too much value on So that when it disappointed us, we became angry, frustrated, bitter, depressed. 
some passing thing. Have you ever hated a political candidate? Why? Did his taxes threaten your sense of self-control or self-decision uh, or your money, your precious money? Why were you jealous of a classmate? Did she threaten your power or social standing? Why have you been envying another person's marriage? Have you idolized relationships of a human nature or sex? Demetrius certainly made silver shrines, but he had more idols. We know because when he called his fellow craftsmen together, he said, men, you know we receive a good income from this business. But Paul says that man-made idols are not gods at all. Paul is threatening our income, a good income, causing Demetrius to feel threatened. It's been said that money talks, but sometimes it screams. Many Christians had forsaken their sorcery books at the expense of a lot of money. That's what we hear in 1919. Money wasn't as important to them anymore. They didn't care. Jesus was more important. But this was affecting business, says Demetrius. Was he in it for religion or the money? He revealed his heart. And further, the way of Jesus threatened something more than money. It threatened Demetrius' power and position. The craftsmen's guild had a high standing. Verse 24 says the silver shrines, little altars made of precious metal, brought in no little business. This was big business. In fact, verse 27, he was afraid our trade will lose its good name. Fortune 500 companies like to make some money, but, but they're in it for their names too. Their trademark is worth a lot to people who, who, who value their name. How many of us live to be a big deal for a big name. Ask the student who's been popular throughout grade school, but now at junior high, they're suddenly threatened by a new kid coming to town. And this student is gaining friends quickly. They're smart, they're strong, they're fast, they're good looking. They get the starting position on the team, first chair in the band. They could be valedictorian. Is that a threat to my friend group, to my popularity, to my good name? I think Tim Keller is right. Often our negative emotions of jealousy and envy and bitterness can be traced back to our idols. Taking some incomplete joy of this world and building our whole lives upon it for our hope, our sense of worth. If the government subtracts the tax break from last year, we become bitter, bitter and angry. We want to protest. And then the ability we had last year to do certain things that we like to do as a sort of status or standard of living, it decreases. and We pout. We become disillusioned. Are we so different from Demetrius at times? Demetrius and his cohorts were growing negative emotions like a greenhouse grows plants. I'm reminded of a string of suicides by formerly wealthy and well-connected businessmen right at the time of the 2008 financial global crisis. But ostensibly, the livelihood of Demetrius and his guild was really dependent on, on Artemis and, and true devotion to her. Who was she and why was she so important at Ephesus? Well. Historically, a meteor crash landed at Ephesus. The rock had many bulbous outcroppings on it, which some began to say looked like a multi-breasted woman. And so, 
a cult to the goddess of sex and fertility began. And people had wild, drunken orgies at regular times of the year in Ephesus, taking trips to Artemis' temple to meet the prostitutes. Physical pleasure, sexuality, and, and debauchery and drunkenness without control became their ultimate happiness, their goal of the year. But Christians quit this cold turkey. They changed their sexual morals, their actions, even their attitudes to follow Jesus. In fact, commentators Wearsby and Willikin say that after the spread of Christianity, I found this interesting, they said the trade of making charms and idle accompaniments fell almost completely off the map. This wasn't because obviously everybody in the empire became Christians, but so many did that a living couldn't be made anymore. Idolatry lost its market share. It vanished. It ended. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, the unfolding of your word gives light, and those in the dark had been enlightened. They changed. They said that more than a rocky outcropping had visited the earth, God himself had come down to become human, to visit us, and he himself was chaste and pure. So they followed the way, a threat to the idols of money, power, and sex. And this negative emotion from their their surrounding community became a riot. It became a disturbance with no way forward. Demetrius was the head of the guild, maybe. Maybe he was the head of the the silversmith's guild. I would think their numbers would have been 666, right? They were just, just a bad guild. And he made his final pitch at verse 27. As though very pious, he made his appeal in pious terms about the goddess causing a religious fervor. We read at verse 28, when they heard this, the crowds were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions. They rushed into the theater, a place holding around 26,000 people. The assembly was in confusion Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, supposedly saying, we're not with these Christians. Alexander, you tell them. We're we're okay. We're not like them. To make a defense before the people, but when they realized he was a Jew, the Gentile crowd all shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, did you notice Most of the people don't know why they're there. They had no way forward because they had no way to realize why they were where they were. They were caught up in it, maybe a lot like their annual event surrounding the goddess Artemis. The theater at Ephesus, as I said, held 24,000 people. Imagine 24,000 people chanting for two hours. What, What do we have like that in our... Society today, great is Taylor Swift. (laughs) You know, maybe that would be about the best thing we come up with. I don't know. Great are the Denver Nuggets. Great are the Nuggets of Denver. Right? Maybe that's something they could be saying. Great is the President of the United States. No, great is a meteor rock. for two hours. Sounds a lot like the prophets of Baal in the Old Testament. Maybe a bit like protesters in Chicago, Portland, or D.C. Destroying property, yelling, but finally admitting, many of them, we don't even know why we're here. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the Scripture speaks of one who hates the order of obedience to God and love for Him with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, 
and seeks chaos to destroy what God made good, beginning with humans. Idols are unreasonable. They can't reason. And those who make them make a passing thing the ultimate thing, like setting up a shrine to toilet paper. You remember those who made toilet paper the ultimate commodity during the uh, pandemic? And then we find people who are so greedy with their commodity, they're withholding some and only giving it out at certain points because they were greedy. Was it really the toilet paper? No, it was the money behind it. (laughs) Is there anything new under the sun? There's strange things people will idolize. And some today idolize money, power, sex, and themselves, really making their thoughts, their intents, their desires, the measure of everything. If I want it, it's right. But in the process, not knowing anything or really how to move forward or how to agree with others who have different desires. Almost becoming less than human. Beasts, animals. And notice then the assembly was in confusion. Some shouting one thing, some another. It's a sad reality of our schools, universities, and individuals all over, not just the world, but even our country, that they yell different things and demand that their thing be the ultimate thing, or else we haven't valued them, their purpose for their existence, to loudly rally for some cause, Maybe it's the environment or a portion of it, a certain species. The right to kill babies, the right to call a single person they and a man she. In total confusion on gender, sexuality, money, morals, even math and science. And some spending money to bus people city to city People who are pawns in a plan for unrest and disorder. Recently I saw a documentary, it was absolutely astounding to me. A man went to many people in academia asking them, could you define for me what it is you're teaching? And particularly, what is a woman? And the astonishing lack of ability to define They couldn't, but they were certainly loud and proud about how they did know their subject matter even though they couldn't define the first word of it. And had things plastered all about their office to prove it. Benjamin Franklin once said, a mob is a monster with heads enough but no brains, yelling for two hours. but not really thinking about the basis for the argument. Just stop oil. Hours upon hours. Our bodies, our decisions. Black lives matter. Never thinking about the other bodies or other lives. Not really thinking about the basis of the argument. But yelling great is our argument. Max Lerner wrote, every mob in its ignorance and blindness and bewilderment is a league of frightened folk that seeks reassurance in collective action. A mob of, a league of frightened folk that seeks reassurance in collective action. The mob at Ephesus didn't know where they were going. As so many unbelievers today don't know the way forward. But a politician may speak up in the crazy times, a voice of reason. Do we finally have some great one we can look to for purpose and and clarity? We're coming to elections. We're hoping we can find one, one we can put our hope in, a creature, a created thing that will finally help us. We read at verse 35, the city clerk quieted the crowd and he gave reasons why they should settle down. Verse 35, The world knows where the guardians of great Artemis' temple and her image, which fell from heaven, 
AKA people still buy our shrines, our status and power are in place. And then, verse 36, we are an advanced society with courts and a court system. You see, our great name is still here. Let Demetrius take Paul to court if he wishes. And finally, we're in danger of Roman reprisal for a riot without reason. Though our sex parties and riots are usually let go by Rome, What was he saying? He was saying, if we don't be quiet here, the Romans could step in, and what will happen to our money, power, and sex parties? All he was doing is appealing to his idols and theirs. Keep serving your masters. And then he sent them away. They were dismissed, verse 41. So dismissive, so sad. Sheep without a shepherd. Still under the influence of idols, no voice of reason, which warns us Christians of the one voice we must listen to. Idols are no gods at all, but the people left the riot with their idols intact, dismissed. The Old Testament scriptures say this about the idols of heathen nations. I find this very interesting, so bear with me. 1 Kings 22, I saw Israel scattered on the mountains. Do you know where the shrines of idol gods of the foreigners were put? They were put up in the mountains. And when Israel was making idols, they'd go up into the mountains to their little silver shrine or their gold shrine or their little altar. Ezekiel says they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Zechariah puts a fine point on it. Their household idols utter nonsense and their diviners give empty consolation. The people wander like sheep. It's a picture of Ephesus, but isn't it a picture of our modern society, the lost, idolizing so many useless, utterly unimportant things when they were made to know the God above them? We should be sad. Sad about abortion, not because I'm a Republican. I'm not necessarily a Republican. I'm a Christian. And I'm sad because the devil has fooled people into saying that other image bearers of God, true pictures of him, are getting in my way and should be put away. I'm not sad about gender gender identity politics because it's terribly confusing. It is. But I'm sad because Satan fools people and confuses them into twisting the most simple words in the Bible. God made them male and female. I'm not sad about the sexual revolution because I'm still married to the woman I love. I'm sad because it has been a riot that preys upon the confusion of young people, a veiled attempt by the devil to keep God's people from the peace, the truth, the intimacy, and the blessing of either godly celibacy or a godly marriage, putting God before anything else. And really, finally, I'm sad because the devil fools people into becoming confused rioters, complicit in harming others in their own bodies without any connection to their maker. And you know what? Jesus cared more than me. Here's what he said at Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. We read, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And as he who said, come to me and I'll give you the most sincere rest, reliance, and peace you've ever had. While citizens are dismissed by the city clerk, while our government seeks voters extensively and strongly at a certain season, but then almost discards them after the elections, 
Jesus welcomes his people. There's only one voice to listen to, and the voice doesn't discard or dismiss. The voice welcomes, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Come, follow me. The one, the only way to know your purpose in life is to know the God who sent his only son for you, who calls you into fellowship with him. And if you want to know the new life of purpose and direction, of truth and knowledge, of clarity, only the God-man, God who came not as a meteorite from heaven, but God who came in the form of a human, a baby who grew up and was perfectly obedient to all of God's laws, who once gave himself to die for our sins, who is now risen and very much alive, can give you his spirit to become new. Would you come to him today? He still calls. How do you do it? First, briefly surrender to him. Tell him I give up my idols. Second, tell him you're sorry. Tell him you're sorry for making a life without him. Confess specific idols. Created things that have been more to you than him. Third, ask him for the strength to read his word and the the ability to hear his word and pray to him for a new life. And fourth, do whatever he tells you in that word, trusting him is good, so that fifth, you rest in him and you ask him to help you reach out to other lost sheep in his name. He is the only one to listen to above the riots and the fray. He is the way, no matter what other people may be living like. And his is not a gathered group of rioters, but a church gathered in peace and order to listen to the Good Shepherd. That's why I praise God for you here tonight. And I pray that our elders and deacons will lead us in his way. Let's pray for them and for ourselves. Amen. Oh God, we know that your kingdom is not a kingdom of strife, conflict, fighting. It is, a, it is a kingdom of joy and peace and patience in the Holy Spirit. Giving up the strivings for things that are small to know the one who is great. And I pray that your people, even us here this evening, would be tools in your hands to go out with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not in wild, uncontrolled lusts and pleasures, but in the kind of trust in you and obedient life that calls some to say, what gives you your hope? What has given you your joy? What has given you your peace? And we may be able to say it is not what but who. And we may tell them about you who lived for our obedience, died for our sin, and is risen to lead us all the way to a day without it. Help us, Lord, to put away our idols and to love you fully. For Jesus' sake, amen. We come asking the Lord to uh, lead us as we sing. Lead on, O King Eternal. Let's stand and sing.
gracious, the loving and risen Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you a spirit of peace. Amen.